Welcome to Bad Gear, the show about the world's most hated audio tools. Synthesizers can be considered a mature technology. Traditional manufacturers focus on the regurgitation of classics, market disruption is limited to design overkill and process optimization, and real innovators are crushed by the relentless economics of this oversaturated niche. Today we are going to talk about Hydrosynth. This range of next generation synthesizers cast a hype that usually only only comes with the release of Scandinavian hipster gadgets, and depending on whom you ask, they're either the CS80 of the 2020s or a harsh and digital sounding testament to the demise of a culture. At the first glance, Hydrosynths are ticking all the VST in a box boxes. I opted for the Explorer version. Because A, it's easier to film, B, they all sound the same, and C, I can't play keyboards anyways. Even this gateway drug among Hydras comes with shadily patented polyphonic aftertouch. But you will have to make do with a smaller display and reduced number of adult sized knobs. But more of that later, the synth engine offers 8 voices of polyphony, and is based on so-called waveform scanning oscillators. Classic VA shapes are accompanied by a rich selection of digital monstrosities for every occasion. The aforementioned scanning technology can be found in two of the three oscillators and is a simplified wavetable feature with wave lists of up to eight slots. These oscillators are embedded in a somewhat traditional synth structure depicted on the front panel. This interactive signal flow chart lets you access its most essential building blocks and gives you a glimpse into the sound design facilities that make the synth unique. In addition to the ring modulation, noise section, you will find four mutators allowing for two operator FM, wave stacking for super saw like waveforms. Sync, three types of PWM, a phase shifter, and the harmonic mutator I've yet to fully understand. The raw tones are shaped further by two filters which can be operated in serial and parallel mode. Filter 1 lets you select bread and butter models. With drive. Number 2 is morphable between a 12 dB high, band and low pass. 5 overpowered LFOs and envelopes not only modulate staples like amplitude and filter cutoff, they also can, together with the awesome performance controllers of the top shelf models, be freely routed using a 32 slot modulation matrix. Macros assist you in controlling the abundance of parameters. All this is topped off with a truly epic sounding FX section. A multi FX unit each before and after reverb and delay. Nice! You can work around the instrument's complexity with a convenient randomization feature and non-keyboard players like me will appreciate the chord functionality and roided up arpeggiator. 
The synth is Eurorack friendly and rose to social media fame mainly due to its super cinematic pads. and ambient sounds. As mentioned before, hydrosynths come in four different flavors, keyboard, desktop, explorer and deluxe, the latter being the only variety with a polyphony count of 16 and by timbrality. Based on the same synth engine, they mostly differ in size, keyboard implementation, connectivity and UI awesomeness, with the ribbon controller being reserved for the keyboard and deluxe version. In light of all this sci-fi synth goodness, you might want to keep in mind that the underlying technology is slightly overwhelmed by what's going on. The internal preset browser tends to lag when scrolling fast, saving patches will silence your synth for a brief moment and I've yet to find a way to seamlessly switch between patches. Build quality is good with a few quite obvious compromises. Especially the little explorer is competitively priced and thanks to my dear friend Dominic for lending me the centerpiece of his setup. ASM hydrosynths were among the most spectacular market entries in recent years. Are they true game changers or is it yet another rehash of tried and tested technology? You have already heard the little Hydra in today's intro tune. I couldn't find a bass preset I really liked, so I made my own. Let's see if there's more where that came from. that a lot. Smooth pad sounds aside, I enjoyed the elegant heft of the bass tone, which required me to take a deep dive into the envelope settings on a quest for the lost punch. Hydrosynths are widely known for modern high-end patches and complex sound design experiments. Time to explore wavetable and FM features and set the arpeggiator to autopilot. I found it challenging to keep the synth out of aggressively digital and harsh sounding territory, especially with some of the more eccentric waveforms and intense use of FM. The arpeggiator is truly awesome. It is not always easy to hit the oftentimes narrow sweet spot of the synth engine in a jam situation. I wanna know if we can isolate some sonic jams in, it's surprising how little it takes when you crank that sweet reverb futurist e-piano etudes for 21st century auditory shapeshifters. There's a reason why hydrosynths have become the gold standard for both deep sound exploration and shameless preset use. However, in between these two extremes it is easy to lose oneself in a dense web of strongly interdependent parameters and although the synth engine is perfectly capable of producing conventional tones too, there are plenty of more convenient alternatives for that, especially when it comes to bass sounds. This being said, the overall sound aesthetics are a breath of fresh air in 
in this aging industry and even those who don't like the modern approach will appreciate the performance oriented UI and rejuvenating effect a new player like ASM can have on music technology. Is it the CS80 of today? Well, Vangelis had a Hydra in his last setup. Now I really want to know what Paul McCartney would use it for. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the episode, feel free to like, subscribe, become a patron and leave a comment what other kind of gear you would like to see and hear on the show.